Okay, good morning. I have postponed until now the discussion of the last set of readings, which are six or seven chapters for, from an open access publication entitled Wikipedia at 20, where editors from different areas, not just academic scholars, discuss the history and the culture of Wikipedia. I did that on purpose because, in my view, the content, the style of most of those chapters are simple enough. You don't need my guidance, you don't need my unpacking, the same way that needed to be done for the first two textbooks by Peter Burke, which sometimes treated important issues in just a few paragraphs and other times really overwhelmed the reader with a large amount of names, dates, numbers, historical details, and I needed to give you a sense of what was relevant and therefore give you a sense of the priorities when you study, when you prepare for the final exam. So this week and next week, I'll be going as quickly as I can through the various chapters of the Wikipedia 20 textbook that I assigned. And I'm doing it today with chapter one and two. If there is time, I want to watch with you at least a segment from a video from the other founder of Wikipedia. Since we watched a video where Sanger, Larry Sanger was criticizing Wikipedia and its culture, it's only fair that we hear from the other side, the founder that stayed with Wikipedia and is still the leader of uh, Wikipedia today, Jimmy Wales. On Wednesday, I'll be presenting some additional apps just to offer you an overview of what is available when it comes to knowledge-based or knowledge management apps. And I'll do this this week and next week. Keep in mind that if you want to schedule a presentation on Zoom to present in front of me, you can go to the calendar or the syllabus or the announcements page and find the link to calendly.com slash Andrea Fedi, where you can find all the time slots available across next week and the week after that from May, from May 2nd to May 13th. As an alternative, you can record a video and share it with me by May 13th. The presentation, of course, is based on your final project and whenever possible, I will reserve some time to discuss the details of the presentation or your project so that I can provide assistance as needed. Otherwise, schedule a meeting, come to my office, schedule a meeting on Zoom this week to discuss your project and how your presentation should be organized, okay? This is a new page and I've added the link under week 13 of the lectures page, the main page of our website. Oh, by the way, I picked a representation of Piazza San Marco in Venice because the Venetian state of the early 1500s was one of the first societies to appreciate the strategic relevance of knowledge and information and how information impacted on both the economy and the political affairs of the city. Therefore, it was also one of the places that the governments that relied the most on archives, for example, that collected information, that created a network of spies, informants, and diplomatic envoys to gather information that could advance the growth of the economy in this state 
and also their political agenda. Chapter one, I've included the link to the page from which you can access the PDF, but as I said, the link can be found also in the syllabus and all of the PDFs of the chapters are unlocked, are accessible. You can read the chapters on the screen of your browser or download them, print them, etc. Is about the history of Wikipedia and the various failed predictions that Wikipedia would die, would become extinct, would decline. I have reproduced here several passages that are key passages indicating the page numbers in square brackets. And again, there is a much more in the rest. There are some examples that you can find. Overall, as I said, this is one of the chapters that is easy to read. Both chapter one and two are about 15 pages without works cited and footnotes. So the beginning of this chapter tells you that uh, Wikipedia, when it was created, was not taken seriously. It was considered to be a quirky creation of digital culture. And the very fact that Wikipedia claimed to be an encyclopedia uh, created a backlash. How can you claim to be an encyclopedia since you're not relying on vetted expertise? on experts that are qualified, that have credentials. If you're offering something that anyone can edit and anyone can access, then where is the intellectual value? Where is the commercial value? In this, you cannot be serious on either side of this kind of debate. However, even after it was clear that Wikipedia was growing beyond the greatest hopes of their founders, who had this target of 100,000 articles uh, within five or seven years, when in fact, by 2005, they had millions, millions of articles in the English version of Wikipedia. Even after the growth, the exponential growth of Wikipedia lent it some credibility, through the following periods, there were recurring voices saying Wikipedia is dying, Wikipedia is dead, it's going to be extinct up to uh, today. The second point in here is representative of a theme that you find in chapters one and two. The idea that at the end, if you have to assess not just the reliability, of Wikipedia, but you have to assess the value to be attached to this whole platform or enterprise. The final conclusion must be, yes, Wikipedia is not completely accurate. Wikipedia is not completely neutral. However, they do the best they can. They mean well, and uh, they are driven by good values. Maybe they're not always implementing them effectively or successfully, but it's better than what we see around, especially if you look at politics, especially if you look at the commercial sectors, both of those sectors have lost the trust of the people, the confidence of the people. Wikipedia, not as much. It's a bit of an exaggeration, right? Because this assessment of Wikipedia ex emphasizes to a fault the political or social goals of the platforms. That is to say, in reference to the social and political missions of Wikipedia, this judgment that it is essentially good or they mean well and they have ways to rectify whatever they do wrong or whatever is biased is correct. If this statement is predicated upon this if statement, or if corollary, 
if users are looking for things that relate to the social and political missions, entries, pages, information, more often than anything else. Is that the case? Or is it instead that Wikipedia was not affected by social and political controversies exactly because most users are looking for other kinds of information in this digital encyclopedia? And they continue to rely on that without uh, really taking at heart any uh, of the political and social controversies or shortcoming. So keep that in mind when you read this, that there is this, both in chapter one and chapter two, this kind of angle whereby the social and political mission of Wikipedia are considered to be primary, which could be in the culture of the platform, but as far as the users, is it the same? And, and I think this question is relevant and you can give this uh, question different answers, different from what is expected by the authors of the editors of this chapter. So the first of the four period is the period of the foundation of Wikipedia. And as I said before, you can really say that in some ways it was a happy accident, right? That people created Wikipedia not expecting to be so successful, right? Not really understanding the revolution, which is true of a lot of startup. The same thing has been said about Twitter, for example, especially now that with Elon Musk's uh, uh, attempt uh, to buy out the company, people are in the media rehashing the history of Twitter. And, and the same is true of other companies that are now so powerful. The chapter correctly brings into the discussion the example of Microsoft, which by that time was already a very powerful company. And Microsoft made an attempt to change the genre of encyclopedia in a digital format, and they created Encarta, which was based on CD-ROMs. I don't know if you've ever seen one, if you know what they are, small disks. And they were circa, not, not even 2000, but by the late 1990s, by the time I was doing a PhD and I was involved with the McLuhan Institute in uh, Toronto, people were talking about CD as the next digital revolution be simply because the CD had a lot of information that could be stored in it. So Microsoft itself attempted to change the sector, to change the area, the, the market area of digital, of encyclopedia, uh, making a digital encyclopedia, and they failed. And Carta was subscription based, it included a lot of information, but it was never near the level of success that Wikipedia reached from the very beginning. And here you find those numbers that I quoted before. They hope to have 100,000 articles, which was already more than most printed encyclopedia. Larry Sanger, who was fresh out of a PhD in philosophy, thought, well, if we continue at this rate, by seven years we'll have, with 1,000 articles per month or so, we'll have 100,000. They didn't understand how growth would be not linear, but exponential, and therefore by September 2007, they had two million articles. It wasn't about the, the numbers and the growth. It was about the revolution of digital culture, of crowdsourcing, right, of digital communities. That side, they didn't look at. They were focusing on the content, and they were focusing on uh, usership more than the editorial branch. They thought, we'll have a few editors, but not too many because we're not paying them. They didn't expect so many to contribute and it would become a race. They didn't understand, and, and this is not in the chapter, the gamification aspect of the success of Wikipedia. That for many Wikipedians, for many contributing editors, 
it was like a game whereby the number of changes they contributed, the number of new pages they contributed, would rank them higher in the community. So to them, it was a game like any other uh, Call of Duty nowadays or any other game where you want to rank as high as possible. What is the nature of the game? Make changes, introduce new pages, and therefore, this is what they did. Regardless of their expertise, they acquired some expertise. Or from the very beginning, there was this uh, digital revolution of creating bots to, in order to make changes or in order to create entirely new pages. Uh, and, and that was also part of this that I call the gamification part of the growth in Wikipedia. Now, keep in mind, as the chapter says, that even the idea that it should be a free encyclopedia, open to anyone, and that anyone could edit, was not the shared view of the company from the very beginning. There were some possible deviation from this. That is to say, within the company, some believe that at some point, driven by its success, they could switch to introducing ads and selling those ads would both support the platform and also make it commercially viable. Then, because the community grew so much and it was so large, a lot of people, a lot of Wikipedians objected to it, threatened to fork Wikipedia to create their own versions of Wikipedia. So. Uh, what Wikipedia was at the beginning, non-profit, anyone can edit, anyone can access, remained, became the solidified identity of the platform. They switched from .com to .org. <coughs> Sanger was fired because they didn't have a lot of money and uh, he was being paid a lot. After all, as I said, it was fresh out of of his PhD and he needed to support himself. And Sanger from that point on continued to criticize Wikipedia from an academic point of view. Sanger himself was not an academic but it was coming out of academia and brought in that kind of mindset. Therefore, the basis of his criticism, some of which you found in the video we watched a couple of weeks ago, were that Wikipedia is anti-elite, where the elite to him is the intellectual elite. Academia, in particular, the journalist, uh, distant second after that. That it was anti-expertise. It was like they didn't want experts. They'd rather have people who were not qualified experts contribute. Which is true, right? Which is why Wikipedia relies so much on sourcing. You don't need to be an expert because you're not producing primary research. You're just presenting secondary and tertiary sources. Okay. And Sanger uh, created its own fork, Citizendium, that we, we, we saw. After all, Wikipedia itself had been born out of Nupedia, which was based on expertise and failed because it wasn't productive at all. They might have just one or two articles produced in a, speech, in a space of months, okay? And the Citizenium reflected Sanger's mindset, we want the material to be vetted, right? Has to be reviewed before it is published. The, those who, who remained inside Wikipedia not only gave the non-profit, anyone can edit, anyone can access the information, uh, system the identity of their company, they did something else that has consequences beyond what the users understand. They created a foundation, Wikimedia. And to this day, you do have a company that employs hundreds of people. And it doesn't seem to be a lot for something like Wikipedia that only in the English version has six and a half million articles. However, having a few hundred staff working on rectifying 
intervening behind the scenes on what is happening in Wikimedia provides a balance, keeps Wikipedia from becoming completely chaotic. So, yes, Wikipedia is based on crowdsourcing. It is non-commercial. However, not entirely so. They do have a company. They do have full-time staffer. The number of those staffers has increased through the years, okay? Because initially their idea was just, we'll, we'll get some money from donations so that we can pay for the servers. And so that um, those entries will not go offline ever, right? And people can continue to add, modify, revise and expand the knowledge stored on those servers. Having a company, even though it's not for profit, non-profit, having a foundation with full-time administrators, managers, provides a correction to the crowdsourcing, right? It's not, cannot be complete anarchy because it's not just the users. There is a leadership, okay? And it's administrative also. So at the beginning in this period, the question was, what is really Wikipedia? Because they claim to be a digital encyclopedia, but are they really an encyclopedia? Simply because they call themselves such. Are they a wiki or both or neither? And, and of course, even from our point of view, we can say it is not just an encyclopedia. It is not just a wiki, although it does have elements of both. Right. So Ward Cunningham is the person who created the label of Wiki. He gave it a name and is one of the pioneers of this kind of technology during the 1990s. And when he, during this early period of Wikipedia, intervened in the debate about the nature of Wikipedia, his answer was Wikipedia will always be a Wiki. Okay? It doesn't matter how many entries they have. They're not an encyclopedia. Because, of course, he looked at two of the uh, most prominent features in a wiki from his point of view as someone who understood the nature of this technology. The idea that there was collaboration and wiki are made for collaboration and the idea that there was a space for discussions through the talk tab. Right? So, to him, those were the driving forces, not the content for this platform. Others who intervened uh, and who were both part of academia, such as Clay Shirky, and part of the industry, because Clay uh, also worked in the digital industry, Dana Boyd, whom you find quoted down, worked for Microsoft, had also different views. Clay Shirky's view in particular is interesting because he said, well, Wikipedia may not be labeled an encyclopedia if you just go by the standards of Britannica. So if every encyclopedia has to follow that one model, which no doubt was successful for more than 200 years, but cannot be the only model for an encyclopedia, if that is the only standard by which you measure what an encyclopedia is, then Wikipedia is not like Britannica. However, if you're willing to conceive that the idea of an encyclopedia, the models, the standards can be adapted to the digital era and the 21st century, then you can call Wikipedia not the encyclopedia, but an encyclopedia, a form of encyclopedia, which includes peer review, collaboration, discussions, <coughs> etc. Okay, so as you find this passage, Clay said, I think Wikipedia will be an encyclopedia when the definition of the word expands to include peer production of shared knowledge, not just Britannica's institutional production. And after all, even Britannica changed. Even Britannica, of course, suffered downsizing. And by this time, uh, there were only a few dozens 
staffers, full-time staffers in the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, itself. So even traditional encyclopedia were subject to mutation. Boyd, who uh, prefers to use lowercase for her first and last name, that's why uh, Boyd with lowercase b, was afraid of the consequences of relying on Wikipedia. Because what made Wikipedia successful from the beginning was the fact that there was a strong alliance, association with Google, whereby Google offered a lot of Wikipedia results whenever you put in a search string, and it does to this day. So Wikipedia is not only one of the top 10 websites in terms of traffic, it is often one of the top 10 results when you look for anything on Google. Therefore, there would be lobbies, there would be groups that have an interest in introducing bias in the content of Wikipedia because they want to exercise influence indirectly through Wikipedia. They want to gamify the system uh, whereby any content they introduce in Wikipedia comes up ranked high in Google and reaches as many people as possible. So because of its own success when it comes to search algorithms, there would be people who want to uh, change the neutrality of Wikipedia, right? And therefore, it cannot uh, remain reliable exactly because of how much the, webs the, 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 the internet relies on information from Wikipedia through Google. For the period 2005 and 2010, the fears about the future of Wikipedia <coughs> were connected to growth, right? Any kind of community growing exponentially, going from a few thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions and then tens of millions of users. Users, registered users, are to this day more than 40 million at any given point in time during the last 30 days, 130,000 or so uh, were active. When you have this kind of scale in your growth, you have endogenous and exogenous challenge, uh, which are fancy words to say challenges coming from inside and from outside. Inside, of course, a large community is a community where members cannot develop a strong relationship. They don't know each other, so they don't know whom to trust within their community. And uh, knowing each other, having a relationship is the basis for a relevant, appropriate, and respectful discussion. So the idea was, can they maintain their uh, open nature with open to collaboration with these numbers? If you cannot really create a, a digital community, a digital community that would have the same kind of strong social bonds. The exogenous challenge is, of course, we are a successful enterprise. People from outside are targeting the platform to influence others through this platform. They want to exploit it. So you have right-wingers, neo-Nazi by the ideological definition of the time, trying to introduce anti-Semitic content, for example. Gamers who were also a part of the gamer community who were also on the right wing side trying to, to introduce uh, other negative uh, ideology. And of course, marketers of all kinds from the economy to politics trying to sell ideas. Right? trying to strengthen the position of a product, strengthen the position of a candidate, of a political candidate, by uh, changing the content in Wikipedia. Still, 
as you will see, this is also a pattern throughout chapters one and two, Wikipedia did react to these threats by introducing from 2005 semi-protection by closing some pages when they became too controversial or closing them, if not permanently, to anyone who did not have a history of changes that were accepted. So strengthening the role within the community of veteran contributors with a uh, verifiable history of positive changes, positive contributions. 2009 through 2017, the predictions that Wikipedia was coming close to their end came with the change in the numbers, the change in the trends with, within uh, the platform. From 2009 on, you have a slowing down in the number of new pages. It becomes difficult, objectively, to find new pages with uh, entries that would be notable enough so that they wouldn't be deleted or make changes that would not be reverted or erased. By this time, also, it was still a community. But there were editors who had 10 or more years of experience who had these huge numbers in terms of contributions and new pages that even newcomers who were just uh, trying to gamify the experience, I want to be known, I want to have good numbers, I want to rank high, found it difficult and, and therefore were scared from entering into the fray, okay? Still, even though the numbers didn't grow as much as possible and there was a slight decline, the number of active editors has been pretty much stable since 2014, and we noticed that even when looking at 2019 through 2022, that uh, number of w roughly 130,000 active editors for any 30 days period is, is, sta is what stability is in terms of numbers today. And again, it's not the same 130,000 for every 30 days period, although there is a core in there of a few thousand who are always represented across a period of months and years. Also, the <coughs> response to this criticism is, yes, maybe the English version of Wikipedia is not growing or even declining. However, Wikipedia as an enterprise that is global is growing, other language versions are growing, are still expanding, and that is true. Although there are many uh, versions of the almost 300 language versions of Wikipedia that have more than a million entries, not many that have more than 100,000 entries. So growth there, percentage-wise, is, is, is conspicuous, right? But in terms of numbers, none of the other versions, with the exception of a few languages, are uh, as big as the original Wikipedia. The conclusions, which are somewhat forgiving, right? In the end, the conclusions in chapter one and two is, yes, Wikipedia is not perfect, but we forgive Wikipedia. It's still good <coughs> enough for us. So conclusion, yes, we can call it an encyclopedia, and chapter two will take care of the issue of reliability. It's the encyclopedia of the 21st century. Like it or not, if you prefer Britannica, we don't care. This is the go-to uh, website for the 21st century when it comes to knowledge and information. And the number of rules, regulations, policies has increased a lot so that Wikipedia can maintain neutrality, reliability, accuracy. But this has scared only some of the users. There are plenty of users that, in spite of this daunting amount of regulatory documents, are still contributing, are still active. It is one of the most significant non-commercial websites, fine, and it's doing a decent job at removing misinformation and remedying manipulation. But the implication for this statement is disinformation and manipulation are there in the platform, right? 
they're not completely uh, out of. Now, what's significant is that more and more other agencies are relying on Wikipedia, including the media, including the press, which is the subject of chapter two, and we'll look at the consequences. And so, will Wikipedia die? No, it won't, in parenthesis, which is quite a, 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 a statement to add to this, to correct. Well, at least for the next 10 years, you won't die. Okay, that's it for chapter one. Chapter two, and again, if you click, you can go and access from there the PDF, is about the press coverage of Wikipedia. So how society, through the media, looked at Wikipedia, and then how the press and the media relied themselves on Wikipedia. So it starts with a very obvious statement. The English version of Wikipedia has frequently been the subject of media coverage with a shift, with changes, right? Initially, it was seen as an oddity. Look what the digital culture, look what the digital revolution produced, right? But of course, uh, the, the, the media were looking down at Wikipedia. We are powerful, we are experts, we handle knowledge professionally, they're amateurs, right? And now, in some areas of society, the idea is that, well, this is shared knowledge. In a society that is more and more divided, we find a community that is able to share the same values to establish knowledge, okay? Which is true to a degree. Even here you find four periods. The dates are somewhat overlapping. Initially, the view that, it, that dominates the coverage of Wikipedia is that Wikipedia is anarchy from the point of view of authorships, right? Because authorship, because anyone can edit whether they're qualified or not. Therefore, Wikipedia, yes, can be, may be successful, but it's a fluke. It's a quirky <coughs> outlier. Why? Because entries are written by anyone. No expertise is required. No expertise is vetted by anyone. You don't even require a real name. That's how amateurish this thing is. It is edited collaboratively, which is not what was done by the media, and therefore they frowned upon this kind of approach. It's free to access, so what are they doing? They're decreasing, destroying the value of information for everyone, including the media. And you can understand how the media feared Wikipedia. To them during this period, this was the consequence of the introduction of the idea of open source software, right? It's like open source software, I create a program, I make it available uh, uh, to everyone to change, modify, reuse, and this was the application of that model through encyclopedia. So clearly there was a lot of skepticism in the media this is intellectual anarchy, this is no way to handle knowledge, and as I said, if knowledge is free, then how can the media or anyone like them survive? A big change in the perception, popular perception of Wikipedia came from the influential magazine Nature, who decided to perform a study that was published in December 2005, comparing Wikipedia to Britannica itself. The stunning result was that contrary to popular perception, in a random sample of relevant entries, relevant meaning not so minor entries, found that Wikipedia was as accurate as Britannica. Of course, if you are relying correctly on secondary sources, it should be pretty much as accurate. Even when the uh, incident of the journalist who in a Wikipedia biography page was connected to the murder of 
uh, Kennedy, of President Kennedy, even when that occurred, nature confirmed that it was not indicative of a widespread problem with Wikipedia content. It was the exception, the very fact that it was corrected soon, not right away, but soon, bodes well for Wikipedia circa 2005, right? Again, is this positive, idealized view of Wikipedia? They're good, they mean well, even when they're wrong, they have corrective measures. They can amend themselves and therefore uh, they can sustain their success. During this period, the success of Wikipedia was such that uh, one of the terms introduced was the wikification of knowledge, right? Community-based uh, distribution and circulation of knowledge-related content. And it was during this period that Jimmy Wales uh, went to TED, the TED Talks, to talk about the creation of Wikipedia and maybe, I don't know if there is time today, but otherwise you can click on this um, link and watch the video yourself. It's about 15 or 20 minutes. It is during this period that the signpost was created as the bulletin, as the newsletter of the Wikipedia community and increased the idea, the awareness that they had a public and social role. But again, these articles tend to exaggerate the social and political mission of Wikipedia. I'm not sure that is their primary, primary core function. This section is kind of funny uh, and reminds me in many ways of the college humor video, Professor Wikipedia. It starts with the uh, successful uh, comedy of the Colbert Report on TV. Uh, and there were two terms that during this period were introduced in a lot of jokes. Uh, one was truthiness as opposed to truth, uh, according to Colbert, Stephen Colbert. Truthiness is the truth that we want to exist. So, do you want to save the elephants? You want the elephants not to die? Go on Wikipedia and change the number of elephants that die every year. That's it. That's enough truthiness to make you happy, right? Because anyone can read that. And people actually went and changed the numbers following the prompt of the comedian. Then he introduced the terms wikiality, which is the reality according to Wikipedia, right? Because it's not, may not be real, but it's what the majority decided to be real, the same way that allegedly, if a majority of Wikipedians decide that something is factual, or true or accurate, it will be uh, introduced uh, or kept in a Wikipedia page, okay? Which is kind of an ironic angle to something that was real. The New York Times came into this discourse trying to introduce wiki truth, right? The idea that uh, you have consensus among, within a large community, and the large scale of the community, the numbers creating the consensus about what is true, replaces the expertise of single experts who may have a lot of authority. So big data, small data, right? You can look at it from this point of view. And in this kind of controversy, That's where you have the scandal about a user, SJ, who <clears throat> pretended to be a professor of theology, was a member of an arbitration committee. Essentially, he manipulated his influence, right? So he gained authority by claiming credentials, academic credentials that he didn't have, of course. He was a 24-year-old college dropout, okay? And it's only natural when, whenever you have a community, you can always manipulate your influence within the community, even with false credentials. Although, 
the influence, the position in the community of this particular user was not predicated only on his credentials. It's not like people deferred to him for some entries, for some issues, based on his credentials. It was based on his activity, but his activity was more influential because those false credentials were attached to it. So it's not as simple. By 2004, with the Bush versus Kerry presidential campaign, it was clear that knowledge or part of the knowledge on Wikipedia was being politicized. But again, is this what drives Wikipedia? Is the political knowledge stored in it? And Washington Post talked about Wikipolitics. Others complained that in general, in, in political terms, Wikipedia had a liberal bias. What's interesting is that by this time, and especially through the 2010s, Wikipedia entries were being used as sources for news article research because even the media had such a downsizing that instead of having their own investigative sections, instead of paying their own researchers to provide information to their journalists, they had journalists who had to do everything by themselves. They were a one-man operation in many areas, and so they did what you might do. I'll go to Wikipedia to get some basic information. Now, you have a problem of circularity at this point, because if Wikipedia relies on external sources, but those external sources, secondary or tertiary, rely on Wikipedia, then verifiability and sourcing don't work any longer. And you find a case from this period uh, having to do with Hillary Clinton being valedictorian at her university. Still, during this period, Wikipedia comes up, and still does, at the very top of a lot of Google searches. So it's not just Google, it, Wikipedia, it's Googlepedia. Is this connection between Google and Wikipedia that supports his, its enterprise, right? And we talked about those who want to delete articles that are not notable, those who want to include as many articles as possible. I should be able to finish this by the time that we have. 2011, 2017, in the coverage by the press, uh, it's a lot, uh, there is a lot of attention on uh, bias. Uh, and uh, one of the forms of bias that is recognized is the lack of diversity. For example, the fact that as the New York Times discovered in 2011, in an article that became very famous, uh, only about 12%, one eighth of all users were female. This was, uh, this data was questioned uh, right, because when you register for Wikipedia, you don't have to indicate your gender. And later studies, for example, inside a publication from 2014 called the Global Wikipedia, they uh, discovered that more often than not, women would not declare their gender on Wikipedia. So it was difficult to get reliable data. Still, through this whole period, and up until 2020, in spite of the intentional efforts by the Wikimedia Foundation to increase the number of female contributors, those numbers never uh, went beyond 25% and often were lower, the number of female contributors. So the result, both for the New York Times in 2011, but also for this uh, series of essays called the Global Wikipedia, which I used uh, in the past for, as a textbook for, for this class now, the data is old. There seemed to be a lot of structural bias in Wikipedia, meaning if most of your contributors are white males with a penchant for technology, kind of the geeky guide, what is the diversity of views? Yet, nothing different from traditional encyclopedias, right? Again, if you look at the staffing of Britannica, not just now, but through the last 150 years, you mostly find white males with a certain kind of education. The last part 
is the good feel part of chapter two. Same as in chapter one, in the end, yes, there are many controversies, there are some criticism that is justified, but Wikipedia means well, they're trying to do their best, and even when they err, even when they make a mistake, they have means to rectify it. So uh, they uh, endorse the definition of the Washington Post. Wikipedia is the good cop of the internet, good cop, because even when they make a mistake, they uh, rectify it. They're the good cop in reference to these uh, definitions, post-truth has fallen out of fashion, and now post-truth is fake news or disinformation. After all, Wikimedia has arbitration committees. Wikimedia is the foundation that has Wikipedia in it, as well as about 15 other uh, platforms, right? These arbitration committees called ARCOMS by those in the community. There is neutrality in Wikipedia to a degree. However, what uh, bodes well for Wikipedia is that neutrality is a process, right? It's not a goal, it's not static, it's an ongoing process whereby Wikipedia is not completely neutral, but tries to be more neutral, or at least more neutral in some areas, less in others, etc. And when you look at the public perception, nonprofits in general are regarded as a positive for society, whereby the public has lost their faith, their confidence in big tech, right? Google, Microsoft, but even Twitter have lost confidence. And uh, they, they mentioned in 2018 a famous incident whereby a woman who was given the Nobel Prize in physics didn't have an entry in Wikipedia, even though some of her colleagues, male colleagues, did. And Wikipedia, uh, uh, which originally had a page on the scientists, and the page was deleted, they brought back a page about her. So again, this by chapter two is considered one of those good examples. Yes, they had this mistake because after all, uh, society in general is misogynistic, but they did their best to correct, to address the issue, and they became aware of the issue. So that's good enough. That, that's my presentation of these two chapters. I would recommend that you watch that YouTube video. It's conversational, right? It's interesting, like a tech talk is expected to be, okay?